All right, if you have your Bible now and you want to open up to the book of Psalm, we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 88. Uh, I asked Aaron when he said, feel free to talk about whatever. I said, well, I'll be happy to um, follow along in the reading where we're at and, and speak on a chapter from there if that you want me to continue on. And, um, so I was reading through and my mind kept coming back to this psalm and I'm not sure why on a, a day like 4th of July when we're celebrating and things are exciting and there's lots going on, I come to the uh, darkest of psalms and that's what I choose to do my sermon on today. So uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 18. Follow along with me. O Lord, the God who saves me day and night, I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of trouble, and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie, down, who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who you are cut off from who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness, or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From your youth, from my youth I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. Doesn't seem like the... Uh, greatest passage to dig into on 4th of July when, like I said, we should be excited and celebrating. We've got fireworks, we've got picnics, we've got gatherings, all sorts of things. And this is where we're at this Sunday. I appreciated that uh, Betsy this morning when she was talking about the sermon or the singing, the idea that this was truly what psalms were. That was the original form of lifting up to God our prayers, and, and, and worshiping Him. In fact, Bonhoeffer said that this is the Bible's prayer books, and this was the way that we see God's people originally lifting up their voice to Him in worship and praise. And we can see throughout the Psalms that this is what goes back and forth. And for the most part, Psalms fall into two categories. They're either praises or laments. The praises we see constantly versus praising God and all that he's done. He's my fortress. He's my shelter. He lifts me up. I will sing of your great love forever. All these constant praise. And in the laments we see that crying out to God, that the despair, the sorrow. But one of the things that makes Psalm 88 completely different than all the others, is it's not really the most uplifting psalm. In fact, it's downright depressing as you read through it. It presents a really bleak picture of what Haman was going through when he wrote this. One commentator wrote that this is the darkest corner of the Psalter. Like it, it doesn't get any worse than this. And that's what makes this psalm unique is that in most psalms, even the, uh, the laments 
we see in the passage, or we see at the end of the passage, the person crying out to God and realizing that an answer will come, or thinking that may, or they, they write down the answer that has come back to them, and it kind of ends on a high note as it dips down in that valley of the lament, it comes back up. But as we go through and dig into Psalm 88 here, we'll see that there is no return at the end. There's no high note at the end of this psalm. It's just darkness and bleak. Um, some of you may be familiar with the name Horatio and Anna Spafford. It's a name that um, some of us are familiar with. If not, you're definitely familiar with what Horatio wrote, but like our psalmist here, they spent a lot of time in the valley. There was a lot of despair and darkness in their life. Horatio Spafford was born in New York in 1828, but it was not until he moved to Chicago and married his wife that he became well known. He and his wife Anna were active in church. They were friends with people like D.L. Moody and the big shots of uh, the evangelical world at that time. Their house was always open to visitors and they loved and were known for their faith. Horatio was a, a lawyer by trait and he owned quite a bit of land in Chicago and in that area that's where quite a bit of their wealth came from. But much like Job in the Old Testament of the Bible, tragedy would come in great measure to their happy home. When their youngest son was four years old, Horatio Jr., he died suddenly one year of scarlet fever, and that would be the starting point of the sorrow that would come. It wasn't even a year later, in October of 1871, when Mrs. O'Reilly's cow kicked over the lantern, setting the whole city of Chicago ablaze. And as that massive fire swept through Chicago, devastating the city, bringing about death and destruction, there was a large financial loss for Horatio and his family in that. Their properties were burned to the ground, um, and they lost a lot financially in that part. Two years later, in 1873, was when the real tragedy for his family hit. They decided that they were going to take a small vacation to England and due to uh, some business dealings going on, Horatio stayed behind and sent his family off ahead of him. And it was while his wife and four daughters, his 11-year-old Anna, nine Margaret, five Elizabeth, and two Tonetta, were on that ship crossing the ocean, another steamer came and crashed into their ship, and their vessel sank in a matter of 12 minutes. 226 people lost their lives that day. Horatio would lose all four of his daughters and almost his wife in that one setting. Remarkably, his wife survived the tragedy. She was found unconscious, clinging to a board floating in the ocean. But the tragedy wouldn't end there for his family. Uh, they would go on to have a few more children, but sadly, a few years later, his son Horatio, named after his father and his son, would also die at the age of four. That's quite the, the scale of testing, if you look at it. That's a, a lot of stress and despair and anxiety for God to put one family through in a relatively short period of time. We look at this psalm, it's much the same. We see uh, Haman start out with a desperate cry, right? He says, O oh Lord, the God of my salvation, I have cried out by day and in the night before you. Let my prayers come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. He starts out with a cry to the Lord. Even in the midst of feeling overwhelmed, we get a little glimmer of hope in this passage. That's really the only glimmer we see because after this it goes downhill from there. 
the idea that he understands that God is his salvation. He rests assured in that, but little else in this passage. But we see that he has his assurance in Christ, and that he says, O Lord, the God of my salvation. And he points out that he's praying continually, right? Day and night I come before you. Let my prayers Come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. He's crying out to God. I'm, why am I in this situation? What's going on? And he feels like it's falling on deaf ears. Charles Spurgeon in his commentary on, his commentary on this passage says, His distress had not blown out the sparks of his prayer, but thickened them with a greater urgency, till they burned perpetually like a furnace at full blast. His prayer was personal. Whoever had not prayed, he had done so, and it was intensely earnest, so that it was correctly described as a cry, such as our children utter to move the pity of their parents. And it was unceasing. Neither the business of the day nor the weariness of the night had silenced it. Surely such entities could be, not be in vain. That idea of how bad have things gotten that you have to cry out all day and all night for God to hope to hear what you are saying. It's been a while since I've felt so down in the muck and mire that I have prayed nonstop day in and day out for God to bring about a change or to answer a prayer. But here Haman gives that cry out. But after that, that idea of God is my salvation, I'm crying out to you. He gives uh, little care or glory to go any further in his praise to God. But rather, he starts to pour out his trouble before him, even questioning what God is trying to accomplish. In verses 3 through 5, he says, For my soul has had enough troubles, and my life has drawn near to Sheol. I am reckoned among those who go down to the pit. I have become like a man without strength, forsaken among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more. Haman lays out all his troubles here, right? He doesn't just say, you know what, God, there's this, or maybe this. He just lays it flat out, right? He digs, digs deep right here. Troubled to the soul of his life. You know, it's one thing when burdens are on you and your house or you feel that stress, but when it digs to your soul, to the very core of who you are and what you understand, you know troubles have gotten intense and thick. One foot in the grave. I've had people tell me like I, that I look like I have one foot in the grave, but that's usually after like three days of not showering or something. Right? But he is literally saying, I feel as though I have one foot in the grave. Lord, that I'm this far from death. That he has absolutely no strength. If Thad was here, I'd point him out right now and say, Thad has a tendency to do what we call in our house the flop. It's probably been known as other things throughout time, but he'll have a sibling come up and push him or something like that and instantly he's on the ground crying. Something's broken, something's bruised. It's the worst thing that's ever happened. Right? I'll walk up and I'll check him over, no bleeding, no, you know, broken limbs. I'll tell him he's fine and to walk it off and stop faking it. Usually he hops up, laughs, and goes about his way. But he's tried to master that thing, right? That, oh, if I really make it sound bad, mom and dad are going to get after my brothers or sisters. We've learned to understand that. This here, what the psalmist is speaking about isn't a flop. He's not just saying, oh, things are bad. Woe is me. Things are terrible. He's actually laying out that this is the bottom. This is complete and utter darkness. He's in great pains, and he uses, like a painter uses a paintbrush to paint a beautiful picture. Haman here points out for us and draws a, a, lays out what I think is a, an amazing picture of the troubles and sorrows that he's going through. 
And much like the losses of the Spafford family, he is in the midst of some serious pain and sorrow and wants to know. He wants everybody to know that that's where he's at. That's his sorrow and pain. In verses 6 through 9, we see him points out to God as the source of his problems and verses. And this is where this passage starts to get a little interesting when you start thinking about church and God and Scripture, that God has brought all this wrath on him. As I was writing this out, I had to pause for a moment at this spot because it's not an easy thing to say when you think about it. Sometimes that's a hard thing to say in church, that something this bad and this terrible was brought on this person by God. Right? We hear a lot in church about God will give us what we can handle, or these things are from the, the devil. But if we're really going to say that God is in control and he is all-powerful, we have to recognize that the things that have been brought on us are from God. And he lays out, Haman here lays out his affliction. God has brought him down, down to the very depths in verse 6. He feels the weight of God, and he, he compares it in verse 7 to the angry breakers crashing over him. I don't know if you've ever been to a big body of water, um, like one of the oceans or up to Duluth, but waves have an amazing uh, power behind them. A simple little wave that, you know, maybe is this high, you wouldn't think it would just plow you over. But a few years ago, we got to go out to the west coast to visit some of Sarah's family. And I remember the kids running out to the ocean and waves just hitting them and trucking them over, just plowing them into the ground. And them getting up and laughing because they weren't expecting it. But that idea, that power that the psalmist gives us here of the waves pounding down on him. I imagine, you know, this person just sitting there and wave after wave is his sorrow pounding down on him, getting pushed around. That's pretty vivid imagery of how deep that darkness was. That idea of the waves just pounding the shore and pounding him. Verse 8 is probably one of the, the bigger struggles and that idea of he is utterly alone. You have taken me from me, my closest friends, is what the NIV reads. You know, it's bad when you're in the midst of something and you've got friends around you who can come alongside you and lift you up and bring those little bits of hope in the midst of those dark times, but when you get to that point where you feel utterly alone, that those that are closest to you are even separated from you, that's when life seems its darkest. And in verse 9, the first half of verse 9, he says, My eyes are dimmed with grief. He calls out to God in a seemingly futile attempt to get him to listen in the second half of verse 9. I call to you, O Lord, every day I spread out my hands to you. How dark does it feel when we call out to God and it feels like he's not listening? When we're alone and all those around us seem to have gone away. That can be pretty dark times. I can only imagine as Horatio was heading across the ocean to meet his wife, what was going through his mind as the captain of the ship pointed out to him as they passed over where his daughters had died. Thinking back over the loss of not just his children, the financial loss, but a son a few years earlier, that burden must have been heavy on his heart. And it seems like right now he would have been in the same boat as our psalmist. Why this pain and suffering, God? What brought this about? After he points out that this affliction has come from God, Haman has a few questions for God. Verses 10, 11, and 12, he kind of repeats and 
brings about these questions. Will you perform wonders for the dead? Will the departed spirits rise and praise you? Will your loving kindness be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in abandon? Will your wonders be made known in the darkness and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? All his questions ask the same thing. How can I praise you if I'm dead? What glory is brought to you, God, if I'm in the shape that I'm in? We see Haman here equates praising God, testifying to his goodness, his steadfast love, his faithfulness, his righteousness, his wonderful works with life. There's that connection there. One commentator noted for the psalmist, the relationship between praising and not praising was the same as between living and not living. So how can I praise you, God, if I have one foot in the grave? In this passage, we can see that the psalmist assures us that while he is alive, he will praise God. But so too in Psalm 88, the assumption is behind the question, verses 10 and 12. The idea for Haman is not, I am not in a place where I can praise you right now. So Haman wants to praise God, he wants to lift up that praise, but he sits in a place of complete darkness, in abandonment with nobody else. How can I give you praise, God, in the midst of all of this? He's not in a place where he can praise right now. You are my God, but I cannot grasp what is taking place right now. And because of that, I do not have that ability to praise you. It's kind of an interesting thought and idea. Things are so bad, he, he knows, he lets us see back in verse 1 that he has that assurance. But he's in a spot where, even though he has that assurance, he doesn't know if he can praise God in this place what he's going through. So how does he get back to a place where he can praise him? We see that in these questions. Lord, how can I praise you if I have one foot in the grave? Will my cries be heard out in those situations? Take me out of this pit so I can get my relationship right back to a place where it was. The darkness is a hard spot. I think the same could have been said for Horatio too as he headed across the ocean to meet back up with his wife after their loss. Going back to his cabin and I'm sure crying out to God in that same way that we see the psalmist here. And not necessarily having words to cry out but having a pen to write down what he did. Amen closes out the psalm with one last list of terrible things weighing him down. We see him cry out to God. We see that terrible list. We see him ask God why. And then he resorts back down to, this is still what I'm going through. But I, O oh Lord, have cried out to, to you for help. And in the morning my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you reject my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I was afflicted and about to die from my youth on. I suffered your terrors. I am overcome. Your burning anger has passed over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. They have surrounded me like water all day long. They have encompassed me altogether. You have removed my friends and companions far from me. My acquaintances are in darkness. Are in darkness. That idea, this just wasn't you know, a few months, this wasn't a little thing. We see him point out this was from his youth on. He has suffered quite a bit of time with this whatever is ailing him. It reminds me of um, Paul and that thorn in his side. Lord, take it away. It's bothered me. It's been an ailment, a pain. We don't know what that thorn is, but it was there continually. We see the psalmist with using vivid imagery to get his point across again, right? God rejecting him. His being afflicted, ready to die. 
since the days of his youth. God's terror, his burning anger, his dreaded assault. All of this swirling and passing around him. Verse 18 ends with now what would probably be a line from a Simon and Garfunkel song, right? Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk to you again. God has taken away all those who have helped him in the past, those who have comforted him in his trials before, so all he has left is darkness. All that is left there is nothing. He's stuck in the midst of that mire. Nothing around him can bring him, help him with what he needs to bring praise to God. So you may think, is that it, Josh? That's where we're ending. Darkness. We're stuck in this spot. There's no answer, no reason for this passage to look back and find a glimmer of hope. We just have to deal with the darkness if we're stuck in it. Struggle through. There are a couple things that I want to take away from this passage. Three things. First, it shows us that even in the midst of the worst circumstances, it's still possible to talk to God, to have a relationship with Him. No matter how bad things get, no matter what God lays at our feet, it's still possible to cry out to God and know that even if we think He can't or doesn't hear us, He does. Even if we get to a point where we don't feel like we can cry out, we have to sit in that silence. Romans 8, 26 says, Now in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. There's that idea that even when we acknowledge, no matter what the circumstances, that we still have our relationship with God, the Holy Spirit is interceding for us in that time. When we can't find the words to say what we need to say, or maybe we just don't understand what we need to say to God, the Holy Spirit is there interceding for us. And second, we learn from the psalm that it's part of the believer's experience. Right? This doesn't sound fun, it doesn't sound exciting about being a Christian, but part of the believer's experience is that we're going to feel depressed. And we may feel depressed and not have anything good to say to God. But that doesn't mean we say bad things, right? In his book, C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain, he said there's much to be said about silence and pain. Sometimes we hear God more clearly in our pain. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience but shouts in our pains, and it's God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. That idea of that, even though we may not feel, we may not like where we're at, we may not understand why God has put us in that spot, that's part of our experience, and maybe it's God trying to get across to us something he wants us to hear. And lastly, that idea that how does a psalm like this, how does someone suffering like this bring us closer to God? But we have to understand that God understands our suffering. And it may not be easy for people to ask how a mighty God can put people through something like that. How does a holy and righteous God Put those burdens and troubles on top of somebody. But we have to realize that Jesus went through the same thing. He took all the pain and suffering with him on the cross. He knows what we are going through. He has experienced what we have experienced. And God, as his Father, had to have felt some pain or sorrow in the midst of that too. Because I know when my kids get hurt, I feel that pain and sorrow. God understands everything we are going through. 
In the midst of all the pain and all the sorrow he was going through, Horatio Spafford might not have had the words to verbally cry out to God, but he was able to pen some words that are a good reminder to us in the midst of darkness. So I want to close with just a couple verses of what he wrote, and then we'll end. And he wrote this as he passed over the ocean spot where his children had died. He wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. There's that idea of the waves coming back and crashing over the sorrow so much. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, through trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ, Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Let's pray. Lord, we may not understand the darkness, the troubles, the sorrow, the pain. Maybe we are at that point, Lord, in this life. I don't know. Some of us probably are, some of us aren't. But Lord, we can know that, Lord, you are there with us in it all. Though we cry out and it may not seem like you hear us, you know and understand all we are going through. And in the end, Lord, it will bring glory to you and your kingdom. Lord, I pray that as we go today that we would be reminded in the darkness that you are there walking alongside us whether we feel you or not. And Lord, that in those times, even if we don't have the energy to praise you, that we would still bring our prayers before you. That we would be able to cry out to you, Lord, knowing that you hear and answer those prayers. Lord, I thank you for this day and this opportunity to stand before my fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord and dig into your word. In your name, amen.